All right, we made it. <laughs> all right, thanks everybody for coming. First, let's give a round of applause for all the folks that make NOLACON possible. This is my uh, second year coming out here, and I always love uh, coming out here. It's one of my, my favorite conferences in uh, the whole New Orleans area, so, so really enjoy it. Um, but today's talk is going to be uh, a little bit different than what I normally do. I, I, I normally do a lot of offensive talks, um, and so today's going to be a little bit about uh, defensive talks and deception and what that means and how you can detect a lot of the things that we do as attackers um, in environments. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, though, I still have a lot of offense in this talk as well because I can't just do a defensive talk and not break stuff. Um, but I will keep a lot of uh, defensive stuff in here as well. A little bit about myself. Um, I started off my career uh, working for the United States Marine Corps. I was in the intelligence agency doing uh, cryptography breaking and signals intelligence and stuff like that. Um, did two tours in Iraq, um, one in Bahrain. Uh, so I spent about two years in the Middle East or so. Um, and got out and was kind of uh, in a small consulting shop. And then I uh, landed a really nice gig as a chief security officer for a Fortune 1000 company. And uh, it was funny because I was like a, I was the youngest VP in, in their history. I was like 20 years old and I had no idea what I was doing uh, in any way, shape or form. And so I had to figure out you know, how to run a security program, and I had about 55 people uh, reporting to me um, and uh, figure out how to build a security program. We had a lot of success there. And uh, what was interesting is, you know, I had a great job, um, didn't uh, know what I wanted to do, and I just knew that going into the corporate life every day uh, wasn't for me. So I got out and I started my own two companies. Uh, literally, uh, you know, perfect timing. I had two brand new babies uh, that were coming on the way, and I decided that right now was the time that I had to go and do it. Um, so I literally started off my basement, but uh, I started two companies, Trusted Sec and Binary Defense, and uh, we have about 116 employees uh, in total, and I uh, started about five years ago, which has been really, really great. Um, also started DerbyCon with a bunch of folks, um, so sorry if anybody tried to purchase ticket sales um, at the right time that the ticket sales went online. I, I apologize, I opened up a little early, um, caused a shitstorm, um, but that's okay. <laughs> you got one good, glad to hear it. <laughs> I open up every year, every year, every year early. I'm not going to do that anymore, though. It's going to go right on that time, trust me. Um, I'm also on the news and, and things like that quite a bit, um, talking about a lot of different uh, things, as well as uh, Mr. Robot. If you've seen the TV show Mr. Robot, they use a lot of uh, the skits and things, like uh, they'll use the social engineer toolkit that I wrote uh, to break into like Evil Corp. So like in season two, episode one, uh, Darlene actually um, uh, was using my tool to break into Evil Corp and deploy ransomware and all that other stuff. So it's kind of cool. Um, I've actually got to talk to Christian Slater. He's a really cool guy, but he's like terrified of what we do as hackers, uh, which is ironic because he plays like a badass hacker um, in the TV show. Um, but that's a little bit about my career and uh, where I've, I've gone from. Uh, but what's been nice is, you know, running two different companies, one that's offense and one that's defense, um, I get to see a nice perspective of things of what's happening out there. And, and ultimately where, you know, I could get detected um, and, and hopefully improve my game when it comes to the types of attacks that I do. And so if you look at where we're at in this industry uh, right now, there's a number of different ways to detect attackers, right? And it all depends on the varying levels of, of the organization's maturity around how they detect things. But companies have varying levels of detection. Some may detect executables really well and have known good in their environment and, and look for deviations of patterns, but may suck really bad at PowerShell. Um, they may be really awesome at PowerShell, but suck at all binaries, you know, uh, uh, completely. They may, you know, have uh, web applications with SQL injection, but their users have to give a blood sample to get into their computer. So, you know, you have a varying level of, of security in different organizations. And as attackers, um, it's really important for us to understand what those maturity levels are and where their, you know, uh, uh, deficiencies are at and their, their ways of getting in. Um, but on the defensive side, uh, there's a lot of things that we need to understand, a lot of things that are out there. Um, to really get a full picture around what the types of attacks are. And I'll get in, in, into some of that. And so if you look at some good security practices, um, you know, you look at three things that are, that are core to me when I look at a good, good program. One is protection, you know, obviously stopping the attackers, um, detection, and then deception. Now, everybody's familiar, I'm sure, with detection and deception and everything else. But, you know, as an attacker, there are certain things that I will go for almost every time um, you know, that, that you can use in your environment to entice me to go after it and then trigger the, the oh shit alarm, something's going on. We have kids in here? Is there any kids in here? Oh, there's a kid. Dave's a kid, so yeah, I gotta be careful my gr grammar. Um, but uh, there's a lot of things that we look for um, as attackers, like SPN accounts, um, you know, uh, domain admin accounts, obviously, you know, local link multicast resolution, you know, NBNS, na uh, NetBouse name services. You know, things that we can go after um, as attackers that we can create a whole simulated fake environment over that if you ever see somebody using those accounts in some way, shape, or form, you want to raise an alarm that says, hey, oh man, you know, this, this is not legitimate and we want to find out what's going on. So I'll talk a little bit about uh, deception here in a little bit. But I want to talk about a little bit of the protection, detection, and deception pieces. And so if you look at um, 
you know, methods of detection, it is becoming increasingly more difficult um, to detect a lot of the newer techniques. Like, I don't know if you know today, but they, you know, figured out a way to get remote code execution through BG info. You know, did anybody know that? Now we got one. So person's all right? You mess with my sound? No, okay. All right, just a second. Depends on what you stand. All right, I'm going to stand right over here. Um, but with BG Info, there's a way to actually import VBScript, and you can actually get persistence hooks that bypasses application whitelisting to get you know, direct access to a machine and get around all antivirus and application whitelisting and stuff like that. If you weren't paying attention, you wouldn't know about that, right? And so there's always, you know, sub-T and, you know, uh, harm join, all those guys are always coming out with new ways of doing different types of bypasses and techniques. There's a way to do uh, direct DLL importation uh, through VBScript now. You can load Mimikatz directly through JavaScript. I mean, there's so many different ways um, for us as attackers to evade traditional detection mechanisms that it's really hard for us as defenders to figure out what all those are. I mean, we can say, okay, I'm going to look for PowerShell and Coda command, but that's one of 10 million other indicators on PowerShell that we need to be looking for. And so you look at, at what we have to do as defenders, it's vast, it's massive. But the hope is, is that, hey, we have enough detection in a lot of these different along an attack cycle that we can start to actually defend against what's actually happening out, uh, out there. And I'll talk a little about that. Before I start uh, with, with all those, I want to talk a little about the Shadow Broker stuff. And that's important. I don't want to, it's already been in the news, everybody knows about it. I'm not going to go into the, the specific details about everything. But what was interesting about that was, and this is something that we have to build our threat models around, is that was the zero day angle, right? We stopped talking about that like three or four years ago, or two years ago maybe, because we started worrying all about the users, right? And we still are worried about the users, believe me, that's not getting solved anytime soon. Um, but we're still worried about the users. We're not building a lot of this understanding around zero, uh, zero days kernel exploitation and, and everything else that goes around that. And so we, while we might not, might not be able to detect that specific attack, the methods that the NSA used after that were very predictable. Lateral movement. Everybody's heard about lateral movement, right? Using WMI or RPC or SMB to connect to other systems. Those are things that we can actually detect in environments that while we not, might not be able to detect the specific zero day itself, we may have a capability of actually going and finding it. And so if you look at Eternal Blue and Double Pulsar, um, it was interesting because Emmet didn't help. None of the protection me mechanisms that Windows put into place helped. And it was something where we had a direct threat of something. And, and I thought it was awesome, by the way. Did you see the... Um, it was a CIO, uh, the CIO to one of the, the Department of Defenses or something like that actually confirmed that the NSA gave Microsoft a heads up um, that, that there was a zero day about to be released from the shadow brokers and that they actually fixed it. So it literally confirmed that the equation group was NSA, even though we all knew that. And it really confirmed that shadow brokers was Russia, even though we knew that too. Um, so it just kind of made it 100% you know, real of what we had all thought and kind of already knew. Uh, but it was kind of neat because um, they actually confirmed uh, that specifically happened. And so you look at, at what our controls failed on, in this specific case, you know, is obviously the zero-day angle. And so when you look at, at what we're trying to get out of this, it's time to have a talk about what we're building our security programs around. I love this slide. It's the first time I ever used this one, by the way. I thought it was pretty good. Um, and it's funny because at the end, as I give you a link to go and download the slides, and I remove this one from it, so you can, when you're downloading, you'll get this one in there. But uh, anyways, um, so when you talk about protection and how we build our defenses and our protections in our environments, it's interesting because you have a mix of people that are still using traditional antivirus. You have a people that have jumped onto the next generation bandwagon. You have people that have implemented next generation firewalls. You have all of these different environments and none of them are doing everything that it needs to do in order to protect our, our, our companies in any way, shape or form. And so it's like we're playing ping pong um, for the different types of detection, whether it's behavior or heuristics or artificial intelligence. And man, if you get, anybody go to RSA this year? If you did not hear machine learning or artificial intelligence, you didn't go anywhere at RSA. Like, you could literally be at, like, a bar 16 miles away from RSA and you'd be hearing about machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, and so you see all these methods for current protections of how we're trying to understand these attackers when they're really pretty trivial to get around. I mean, I'm just going to throw that one up there. Hard to get around, right? Or you can just rename PowerShell to whatever you want to, and no problem there either, right? Execute any PowerShell you want to. They're not looking for system.management.automation.dll. They're actually looking to see if PowerShell.exe is in System32 or Syswall64, and then alerting on it, right? So we look at what we're trying to defend against, and most of the stuff that we do is, is a really finite solution. And maybe they have a component that, that doesn't have a substantial amount of false positives. I haven't seen it yet. But maybe they actually do something that, that is, is, is relevant. I'm not sure. So if you look at next generation tools, 
they're designed to try to fix a very niche problem that we have in this industry, and it's our fear of the unknown. We're like, oh, traditional antivirus is only three to five percent effective, but yet, you know, if I go with this next generation product, I lose the hips, I lose the firewall, I lose the central management, I lose, you know, everything else that I've done in my environment as well. But I'm not saying that they're any better in any shape or form. Um, it's a pretty disturbing Star Trek episode, by the way. I think it was uh, they actually applied um, some like, you know. Um, shifting and stuff like that. Anyways, um, but uh, in certain cases, these next generation products don't do a lot of justice for what we see. And I'll talk a little bit about that here in just a, a few minutes. When you look at, at organizations when it comes to protection, to me, where this industry needs to be moving to is good configuration management and known good. So understanding what we have in our environments. And I'm going to use this term, and we all cringe when we, when we if, especially if we've gone through this before, but we need to work on application whitelisting. Everybody cringes and shakes their heads and everything else, and it's a, it's a beast to get in. But let me, let me throw a couple things out there. Ransomware is a good example, because everybody's freaking out about it, ransomware right now, even though we know it's pretty, pretty lame in a lot of cases, right? But how does ransomware get deployed? What's its primary method of, of, of infecting a machine? Well, phishing, social engineering, but what, what is the actual code that gets dropped on the system? Is it, a, is it PowerShell? Is it VBScript? Is it executable? Executable, right? And we know the stat of how many ransomware infections come from executables? 94%, okay? So 94% are executables, okay? Now the initial stage here may be VB script or PowerShell or something like that, but the second stage it goes and it pulls down is typically an executable. Now let me ask you a question. How sophisticated is a 94% dropping an unsigned code, uh, unsigned binary into your environment? Um, you know, how, how sophisticated is that? How hard is it to get around next generation products with that? Or antivirus or anything else out there? It's a Unsigned binary. It's the stuff that we used in like the AOL days in like the 90s that we used to hack on. And BBS is like you'd upload a, like a, a, a you know 300k executable to your buddy to have him click on it. It would take like six hours to upload, and then they download. And then you'd have you know sub seven on the machine, and you're flipping the screen upside down, right? It's the same stuff, just a different variation of it. And so if you look at configuration management known good, like things like device guard and app locker and software restriction policies, like if you're just to say in your environment, hey, don't allow any of my users to execute any non-code signed binaries in the downloads directory or temp directories or user profiles, how much do you think that reduces? Substantial. What if you say, okay, across the board, we're not gonna allow any non-code signed executables in our environment, if you can do that. Substantial. I don't care about the publisher. No one's using code sign certificates. Now, obviously, you need to validate the, the code signing certificates, but no one's using that. Substantial reduction. Now, what does that do? That means 94% of my protection is now in place. I reduce 94% of the noise. And now what I focus on? Alerts and getting better, right? I'd rather know about 6% of the, of the information out there than 100% of the information that's out there that I don't even need to worry about as an organization. I would fight that battle right now if you haven't. Like that's the biggest thing for me on servers, workstations, everything else. It's actually easier to implement in servers than it is anywhere else. Put a put a, a a directory that you allow executables to run from in your environment, you know, and then you know block everything else that happens in your environment. It's just a process change. So there's a lot of things that you can do to do that. So the fact that ransomware is still a problem is a problem, but it's something that's very easily solved. That doesn't mean that as techniques and tactics that we're not going to shift to other things such as PowerShell or and we've already seen obviously uh, shifts in that. Um, or a lot of different things that we're doing out there. So once we have our protection taken in place, now we can start doing some of the magic stuff. And this is actually where most of the fun for me has been. Looking for how do I detect um, attackers, not just from like a signature, but more so on, on behavior. PowerShell is a good example. Why is PowerShell, why is somebody executing a PowerShell command that is a regular user and not an administrator? That's something you want to investigate. Doesn't mean it's wrong. You still want to look at it. Why is the PowerShell command about 200, you know, uh, uh, 200 lines long? It's probably not legitimate, right? Hey, it's using some encoded commands. That's great. Did you know there's 12 different variations of encoded command? Dash E, dash EC, dash EN, dash ENCO, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can do two string. You can do char commands. There's so many different ways of doing it. If you haven't seen um, DBO's, uh, uh, um, Daniel, uh, his, his invoke obfuscation, you need to check that out because there's no way you're picking that up with current detection criteria. Using carbon black. What do I need to do in Carbon Black? Just drop into a PowerShell interpreter and run all the code through there because they don't look inside the PowerShell commands you're executing. So there's so many different ways that we need to look at the, the, the patterns of behavior. Why is PowerShell spawning a child process and then communicating out to the rest of the internet? That's probably not legitimate. Now, run DLL32 is another good one. Why is somebody importing a DLL and that's going out to the internet? Well, actually, Lexmark and HP printers do that, which is really horrible practices. They actually beacon out to the internet, so you have to put a couple exceptions in for those. But across the board, you shouldn't see DLLs directly going out to the internet. RegSVR32, there's so many different ones, CBD, um, methods for actually getting around um, application whitelisting. 
And so you look at what we need to do in detection, and we need to get more visibility, right? Not less. Right, right now, we need, you know, the big fear is not having enough visibility into endpoints and everything else. And then we move to the cloud. Everybody familiar, obviously, with um, Office 365, right? So a criteria for me as a security person to go to Office 365 would be, it would need to either be A, comparable to the security that I have in my environment, or B, better, right? Or C, hopefully I have the same type of detection criteria in my environment to be able to look for things. That would be my criteria in security to say, hey, if I'm going to move my information to a cloud environment, I have to have the same type of protections in my environment from a risk perspective of everything else. Has anybody actually taken a look at Office 365 and actually done a security analysis around it? So you have what's called ATP, okay? ATP is their, their advanced threat protection. Um, they have a, a couple other ones, like their normal mail protection and everything else. Uh, what's interesting with ATP is that it's a new service offering. They have two components of ATP. You have uh, what they call their uh, safe links, and you have what's called safe attachments, okay? So have you ever messed with safe links before? Anybody have that in, in their environment? So interesting enough, um, what Microsoft does is, is when you get a URL sent to your email in, in, in Office 365, it rewrites that URL and says, hey, when you hover over the link, it's now going to say safe links. Now, what does that do in the first place? It obfuscates the destination. So everything that we've been telling our users in all of our education and awareness campaigns and everything that we've said, don't click on things, what have we just done? Now we're implicitly entrusting Microsoft. Do we implicitly trust Microsoft? Ever? <laughs> no, right? You know, they got a lot of great stuff. This is not a knock on Microsoft. What they have to deal with on a volume perspective in the cloud, there's no way security is going to be successful in that model. It's just not going to happen. And the reason for that is I actually did analysis on SafeLinks, okay? I took a look at it, and it's actually started off of a Twitter war. Some, it was a long story. I'm not going to go into the details, but uh, I got a little upset, and so I decided to, to take a look at it. Um, and so when I did, what I found was that SafeLinks doesn't do anything other than a blacklist, blacklist whitelist. doesn't do any dynamic content expansion of the websites. doesn't look at any code in the site itself. What it says is, has this been previously seen before as a blacklisted site, yes or no? So that means anything that you want to do to anybody on SafeLinks is fine, as long as it gets to their, their traditional content filtering, spam filtering software. I used MS14072, I think is what it was, an, uh, an old IE memory corruption exploit that gets picked up by every single antivirus out there. No problem. Gets right through. I used an HTA attack vector through set, which is right here. So here's using an E5 license. And what I'll do is I'll send an email. You can turn the sound off. I, that's Bruce Hornsby. That's well, it's fine. You can keep it going. It's cool, too. Um, <laughs> I randomly put Bruce Hornsby in, in my music, um, in my, uh, it's, it's inspirational, right? It's, it's like an artist working, you know, in code, uh, you know, and you got Bruce Hornsby in the background, one of my inspirations in life. Um, so what we're going to do is we're actually going to create a, a, a malicious link, and we're going to use this social engineer toolkit. Now, this is just out-of-the-box social engineer toolkit. Uh, we're going to use the HTA attack vector. If you're not familiar with the HTAs, I'd heavily recommend blocking them um, at your firewall today. There's no reason to have them um, externally facing in any way, shape, or form. Um, HTAs are high content files. You didn't need to, you didn't need to turn it down. It's fine. No, I'm just kidding. You're good. Um, HTA files can give you the ability. Um, it pops up and basically says, do you want to open this? This website is requiring this to open. Do you want to open it? And you hit open, and it gives you full access to execute commands on the underlying operating system and compromise. Uh, what the Social Engineer Toolkit does, it leverages PowerShell injection to actively go and do it. Um, so we're going to go ahead and send this out. I'll fast forward a little bit of me typing. We don't need to be typing. It literally doesn't do anything. I have a, 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 a link there that just registered a domain name. Made sure I got through all the spam filtering stuff, which is not hard to do. By the way, it's really cool. If you, if, um, you get detected as spam by Microsoft, you can go and request that it be removed, and it's removed within three minutes. So you're good. It's, it's awesome. It's, it's fantastic for us. So I said, and here's the configurations. I had it in the most restrictive um, possibility. So safe links I had in its most restrictive form. Block it if you see it's malicious in some way, shape, or form, okay? And safe links is supposed to protect um, against the link that you click on, right? So there's the email. And there's the link. Now notice when I hover, it's kind of hard to see. Um, but it's now, I'll post it down there. But it's an actual safe links uh, site, so you don't even know where you're going to. It's a randomized link that you can't even tell um, where you're actively going to. Now, interesting enough, um, safe attachments delays your email for 15 minutes while it goes through its dynamic code inspection. Do you know a company that will allow you to delay your emails 15 minutes before you can open your attachment? So we're going to launch a social engineer toolkit.
Uh, we're going to go ahead and create uh, an HTA attack vector. Such good music. And use just internet.support as the, the website. It's just the domain name I registered. A nice uh, little um, uh, side note is you can actually go and look at um, a web a website domains. There's an actual tool. I can't remember the name. It's escaping me right now. Um, but there's a tool that you can um, download. You can do this through GoDaddy or anybody else. But look at expired domains. And you can actually see which classification they've had before in the past and buy them. And so you're already you know, categorized by content filtering sites, which you, if you ever need to get past it, you just buy an old domain that's already been categorized and you're all set and just deploy malware. What's that? Yeah, you buy, buy the domain first, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we're going to click the link over here. This is a Windows 10 machine, fully patched and all that good stuff, right? We're not actually triggering an exploit, we're just running how HTAs were designed to run. And this, it's going to take us to the safe link. Safe link says, yep, you're good to go, you're not on my blacklist. Let's go ahead and run. I'm going to run an antivirus scan. <laughs> You run it, that's what it looks like. It says an HTML application, you want to run it. And over here, we'll get our shell. So that's safe links. Safe attachments isn't much better, by the way. Um, safe attachments, um, you know, it does a little bit more uh, content analysis. It's mostly uh, Windows Defender actually going through and scanning it. You can do time-based delays. Um, you can do uh, name resolution bypasses. Uh, if CPU core is less than two, um, then shut yourself down, gets around, um, a number of other uh, ways as well. So there's a whole bunch, um, but not good either. Um, so in this case, you know, obviously, um, when you're going to a, a cloud environment, does this give equal control or detection off of what we would move to? No, right? This does not give us equal detection or protection mechanisms, and we're moving to that as our infrastructure, right? We're trusting somebody that we're going to go and do it. So, to me, I'd rather build it internally. If you're not familiar with Sysmon, uh, from a detection standpoint, it's free. Um, it's a Microsoft tool. Um, it, it's made by the Sysinternal folks. Um, and Sysmon has some great stuff. You can um, install it. It's an MSI installer. You install it across your environment, and it creates a new event log um, uh, folder. Okay, And in that event log folder, it gives you a substantial amount of information. Uh, for one, if you want to detect Mimikatz, Mimikatz, one of the most hardest to detect because it's all in memory, Mimikatz actually, um, if, you, if you use uh, one of the event IDs called image load, um, it'll actually look for vault, uh, when, when you load Mimikatz, it'll import vaultcly.dll um, into memory, and you can trigger off of that in your sim environment or anywhere else. Now, the problem, though, is that a lot of applications use vaultcly.dll. So what you can do is tune those out um, over time, um, or you can just blanket whitelist, you know, like system32 and your program files directory, assuming that the attacker's not going to run them in there, but they could. Um, so you can definitely uh, flag on that. Uh, what you can also find is things like NPS, uh, not PowerShell, or ways of getting around PowerShell, um, someone renaming PowerShell or renaming something in some way, shape, or form. And that's through the, the system.management.automation.dll. There's actually three DLLs to use. One of them is reflection.dll, the other one is system.management.automation.ai.dll, uh, and then the system.automation.dll as well. And uh, what you can do is you can say, hey, if, if it's not coming from PowerShell.exe or PowerShell underscore ISE.exe, um, then trigger an alarm because we want to see this because it's not PowerShell that's launching this and it's using PowerShell functionality. Um, so you can detect a lot of things, a lot of bypasses around um, that as well. So there's so many different things that you can do um, to get uh, through this. And it exposes what's called ETW, event log tracing. And there's a lot more information for you to be able to consume to detect a lot of abnormal patterns in your environment. Um, Sophos, if you're using Sophos, Sophos hates uh, Sysmon. Like, 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 they do not work together at all. Um, and you have to actually disable image load uh, for Sophos and for uh, Sysmon to actually play together. Now, Sophos, I, I'm starting to question quite a bit because they only support SMB version 1 for their update platforms. Like, you actually have, like, knowledge bases and things like that. Like, yes, you need to downgrade to SMB version 1 in order to, get, you know, be able to do file share access and stuff. I'm like, okay, hopefully they fix that soon. That's great. Um, but there actually is a, um, a bug out for Sophos on their knowledge forums, and they, they're saying it's, they're, they're in communication with Microsoft to hopefully go and fix it. So hopefully that goes away soon. And that's what I talked about, detecting not PowerShell. Um, if it's not PowerShell.exe or PowerShell underscore ISE. And by the way, I see a lot of people write notes. Um, the slides, you can just go to the link after this and get the slides if you want to. I, I publish them after this. So. 
So some suspicious processes to look for. Um, some of the more common ones are these. Um, Tracker.exe, uh, cbd.exe, regsvr32.exe, um, msbuild.exe, uh, rundl32. Um, regsvr32 is probably the most widely used one right now um, because um, you can download what are called SCT files. And SCT files allow you to basically um, execute code directly into memory without ever touching disk. So it's an application whitelisting bypass um, that you can use. Now, it doesn't. The, the scary part is it doesn't have to have a .sct extension. You can just download any file from the internet, and as long as it's in the SCT format, it'll go down. So a good detection criteria off this would be what? Anybody know? Why is RegSPR32 ever going out to the internet in the first place? And by the way, RegSPR32 um, has a built-in proxy uh, browser in it, in the executable itself. So if using proxy support, it actually will hook into that as well, which really sucks. <laughs> Um, so, so many good ones out there. CBD is another good one for getting remote code execution. Um, there was just one today uh, where they had a couple more uh, added to it. So, some, some good stuff. Pass the hash detection. Uh, it's actually detectable through standard event logs. Uh, event log 4624 uh, using login type 3, which is going to be uh, 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 network login. Um, again, and then key length 0. So, that's negotiated encryption for the session um, itself. And if key length is 0, it's using a lower level protocol using a low-level protocol, um, and it's most likely not going to be a legitimate one. And then the account name being the anti-LM SSP. So we can actually detect past the hash just through ch uh, standard event logs. Now, certain things like Nessus, uh, Qualys, things like that may trigger some false positives since they do use a lot of those lower-level protocols that go across. Just whitelist those and then move on from there, and usually the false positives are pretty substantially low uh, when it comes to those. And so if you look at, at detection, detection is hard work. Um, requires you to have a good understanding. I saw a lot of people glaze over when I started talking about some of the application whitelisting bypass. You're like, how do I even you know, start to look at a lot of this stuff? There's so much out there and involved. And that's right. It requires a lot of uh, continuous effort. And that's why you look at what we're dealing with today. I'd rather have protection in place to, to protect against 94%. I'd rather have detection in place to detect hopefully 98% of what's out there. And then if, I, if all those controls fail me, what can I do after that? And that's when we start getting into the discussion of deception, creating things that are um, unique in nature, um, that, that attackers would only see, that attackers would only go after, so you can start to flag on things. So if all my detection, all my protection goes out the window from what I've been able to build based on the resources and time that I have in my environment and the business and everything else that I, I always say I have to deal with, you know, what do I do after that specific point? And so before we get into detection, uh, into deception, let's do something that doesn't get picked up by anything, um, you know, in most cases, unless you have some good PowerShell detection in place. This is where I do a live demo. Let's see if this works. <laughs> That's why I have the Bruce Hornsby. It's, it's, it's dedicated to them. So we have a Windows 10 machine here. Um, it's patched. Um, it's got the latest version. I think it's an older version of Office. And the only reason is because I think it's the only set up uh, EXE I had when I was on the airplane. Um, but uh, this is the latest version of Unicorn. If you're not familiar with Unicorn, you, um, I just did a, a big release on Monday. Um, so a new version just came out on Monday. Um, and it adds a substantial amount of obfuscation techniques into um, both HTA tech vector, um, the PowerShell injection technique, and the um, macro injection technique. Okay. So those are the three main ones that it does um, uh, right now pretty well. Uh, but it's kind of a Swiss Army knife for PowerShell injection. Um, and if you go to github.com slash trusted tech, you'll see the unicorn um, there. But really easy to use. Um, it's written in the best programming language ever, Python, not Perl. Um, had a bunch of people in ponytails get all mad at me. No offense, I'm just kidding. If I could grow a ponytail, I would totally grow a ponytail. Um, and so with Python, you can, um, you know, with, uh, with Unicorn, um, you can specify what payload you want to use. So we're going to use, uh, you can import your own, but we're going to use um, Interpreter. So we'll just use Interpreter, Windows, Interpreter, Reverse HTTPS. And all we're going to do is specify um, the, the macro injection attack. So we're going to do just the macro. Oop, I needed to give it some parameters first. I wrote the tool and I forgot. So I need to give it uh, my IP address, so my callback on what port, and then macro. And it'll generate everything for you. It obfuscates it, so it's completely dynamic each time. Randomized uh, amount, it'll actually chunk up all the PowerShell commands, so it's all chunked up into a long string. Um, all randomized variable names, nothing is, is specifically static. The only thing that, that um, may trigger on this, especially from a macro perspective, is the auto open. Um, auto open can be detected if you're just saying, I'm only going to look for auto opens and macros. It gives a substantial amount of false positives, but people may want that information. What you can do is change that to an on-click, um, and that gets around most stuff as well. So when they open it up, it says on-click, on you have to enable this to actually go and run. That gets around most of them out there. Um, but let's go ahead and open this up. So this is what it looks like. 
Looks legit. Looks good, right? So I'll copy this, and at the same time, I'm going to set up my Metasploit uh, interpreter listener. Son of a. There we go. So I'm just setting up my uh, uh, interpreter listener. I'm going to go over here and save a file, my code. And I don't share between the two folders, so I'm going to move that over here. And then I'm going to create a real quick uh, a macro uh, Excel document. Now notice if you look at this really closely, <laughs> it does things like, obviously that it's even calling PowerShell. It chunks up the PowerShell command itself, like P plus O plus W plus E plus R. Um, so it completely you know, uh, mangles a lot of the code out there. And I'll open up Excel. And this works on newer versions as well. This just happened to be 2013. And I'll create a new worksheet. Go to the Developer tab, which is where macros are at. And if you're not if you're not familiar with uh, Excel and creating your macros, you have to go to the Settings and then make Developer options available so you can create your own macro. Um, and then you go to uh, New Macro. So let's call this Auto. I'm going to change it in a second. So I just copy and paste this into here, and I'm going to save it as a macro embedded. And you can do this in uh, Office as well. Note that in uh, Excel, it's auto underscore open. In Word, it's auto open, no underscore. Don't know why, but whatever. We'll save this. And I'm running the latest version of Defender and everything else, so it, of course it's not getting picked up in any way. Don't have to worry about that. And we'll go ahead and open it. And we're going to enable the content as it is a macro. And we get this error message saying, Microsoft corrupt document. The document appears to be made in a, on an older version of Microsoft. Please have the creator save it to a newer and supporter format, okay? That's, that's what I put in there. It's, you can make the message anything you want to, but as soon as you hit OK, it exits and you're out, and over here we get our shell. So no problem, no, nothing to worry about. Looks legit, it looks like nothing ever opened. It doesn't trigger an alarm from a user. Like, what, what's best about those types of techniques when it looks like it's corrupted um, is you want the user to not feel like something happened uh, when they opened it. Like, hey, this isn't a finance document that contains information that I need. This is weird. Instead, you corrupt it, and then usually, you know, what I'll usually do is I'll compromise a user account through like some weak credentials through OWA, and I'll create a rule inside of OWA to automatically move any of the emails that I sent from the person to the deleted folder, um, and then when I'm sending all these emails out, when they respond back, like, hey, this is corrupt, can you resend it to me? It never, they never see the actual email itself, or I can just move it from another address. Um, so just an easy way of getting shells onto it, uh, and we're all set there. So, new version of Unicorn, go ahead and get it. So what happens when protection and detection fails? Um, and this is when we start getting into the de deception component. And this, is, this part's exciting because I get to apply the same principles of what I would do as an attacker in the defensive side of creating things that I would go after. Like a good example, and I'll talk about this, is Honey Tokens, one of my favorites. I create a domain admin that looks absolutely amazing in every shape or form. You go into Active Directory, you right-click, you click New Users, make it like, the, like the, hey, this is a 2003 service account, can't change password, sorry. You know, um, in, in the description field of it, right? Make it a domain admin. Make it everything you want to make an enterprise admin. Make it look like it's the best account ever. It has every group you can possibly imagine. You look at the groups list and it just scrolls for hours, right? You want this to be the awesome account. Now, make the password a 7,000 character password and lock it up in a safe that requires two people to get into it. You don't need that account anymore. But then you can do something like invoke run as, which I'll talk about here in just a second. And everybody familiar with like the run as command? You know, you can do run as and you can type in a username and a password and it doesn't actually authenticate that. Well, the problem with, with that specific command is it requires um, actual input um, to um, execute the command itself. But there's an actual um, API called set and uh, set uh, login process w or something like that. I can't remember offhand. It just came to mind. Uh, but it supports a function of being able to provide a username, a domain, and a password, and to be able to do run as. And so, if someone created a PowerShell script 
that you can do um, and just, you know, basically you run it as a scheduled task upon login. So when somebody logs into the machine, execute this PowerShell script, and it runs a command in the background. And it runs a command as run as, which means that it does not authenticate to the domain controllers or anywhere else. Make that account, that domain admin account, that's super awesome, this, the service account that you can't change a password from, from 2003, make it a fake username and a fake password that looks really ridiculous, you know, like, hey, this is service account one password, whatever you want to make it. Um, and it, what it does is it injects those credentials into memory. So if you have things like Mimi Cats, for example, or other things, I can actually go into that and see that username and password. And then what happens when you get a failed login attempt with that username and password? You get an alert, right? And then what happens? You get, you, you get your axes out and you start finding that computer, right? You know, you start, start smashing through doors with an axe. Uh, and so I just got back from the Stanley Hotel, uh, which is where The Shining was filmed uh, or, or made from. So I got the whole axe scene in my head right now. But the, um, so those are the things that, that you can do that are very easy to deploy that have no impact on systems that make it super believable for me, right? Those are things that I would go after. A domain admin account that happens to be logged in as the first thing I check uh, when I go into a system would be something like that. So deception happens to be one of my favorite techniques because, again, I get to think very much like an attacker. And so if you look at what we end up doing um, with specific attacks, you look at the life cycle of an attack, whether it's, you know, um, everything from, uh, um, you know, inf information gathering and open source intelligence all the way to post-exploitation scenarios. We can create fake stuff through all of those different cycles to really confuse hackers. And by the way, this is effective. Anybody see what happened in, with the French elections? Everybody see that? I mean, see the news that, that went with that? What's that? Fake dump. Yep. So the actual uh, uh, French intelligence, as well as um, uh, the individual, I can't remember his name offhand, I don't follow politics. Huh? Macron. Macron, thank you. I don't follow politics. I don't even watch the news even though I'm on the news. But uh, um, when, it, when you look at what he did and what his, his, his group did, they created fake email accounts that were directly attributed to his name. They created fake uh, information, fake everything, so that when uh, they leaked all this information, it was all fake. It was all ridiculous information that wasn't even true. So deception actually worked in this case to fool Russian intelligence, right? To actually go Russian hackers. I'm sorry, same same thing. But uh, um, but they went in for Russian hackers to go after them to go and, and, and actually put, put a lot of information out there. And so if you look at areas we can mess with, we can put fake information intelligence gathering, fake LinkedIn pages, fake email accounts of your CEO, whatever you want to, want to start to create as fake profiles um, for your company so that you can have them go to a security person to go through the campaigns and, and, and mess them up and hopefully give them into an environment. So it's a fun, uh, fun, fun thing. Everything to vulnerability analysis, having fake, uh, fake systems out there, exploitation. You know, have them go into areas that aren't legitimate in nature. Some cool stuff. <laughs> fake mailboxes, expose CEO's email addresses everywhere. Uh, again, misinformation. Throw entirely, um, uh, you know, uh, entirely vulnerable boxes out there that have SQL injection and stuff on there that, that spend a significant amount of time going through that doesn't lead to anything. You know, wrap them up in things that aren't legitimate in your environment um, because it's going to start to, you know, frustrate them and hopefully move on to different locations. And then hopefully as they're increasing their attack levels, you start to detect what they're doing. That's the whole goal. I think uh, Jeremiah Grossman in, in Egypt uh, from the Metasploit Project got into it a little while ago. Not, not in a good way, or a bad way, it was a good way. And Jeremiah said, you know, it only takes um, an attacker one indicator of compromise to, to get access to an environment, right? To, or, sorry, um, it only takes one vulnerability for a hacker to break into an environment. In Egypt, who's on the offensive side, is like, well, while that's true, it only takes one indicator of compromise for the blue team to respond and stop that attack in an early stage. And so that's what we're looking for here is, hey, all of our defense stops. Let's start looking at other areas like, like, um, like uh, deception. So let's start with some of the basics first. Um, creating you know, low, mid, and high subset port ranges. You can do that with Windows, Windows Firewall. Accept ports in, but have nothing be there. You, you know, so when someone goes to port scan your environment, they hit random ranges that Nmap would normally hit that you don't use in your environment. Guess what happens at that point? Boom, you got to deny and someone no one should be hitting you on those ports. You should see that in your environment as you're going through. Some basic stuff there. <laughs> I uh, run a tool called Autillery, which is open source and free. Um, it, it, it's a honeypot environment that creates a whole honeypot system. You can go and deploy that. It supports Windows and, and Linux, although the Windows support's kind of hairy. I would recommend probably deploying it on Linux. Uh, Linux works great. Um, but uh, on the Linux environments, what I, what I did at, uh, at Debo when I was in charge of the program there is I actually did a, uh, a direct NAT for all unused IP addresses that I had. And I would just throw them over to all the unused IP addresses, NAT them to my artillery boxes. And then when anybody decided to port scan me, I had an auto shun script that would go and shun all those IP addresses and just block them as they're going through and scanning our environments. Just real easy ways of limiting the noise. And then on the inside, have auxiliary boxes placed across the environment. Um, and so as, when someone starts to sweep, you get early warning indicators of, of what's happening, just listening. 
Then you look at other things like HoneyDocs. Um, there's actually a really great tool that was just released. It's one of the best. I mean, the, the authors are amazing. Uh, it came from the CIA Vault 7 leaks. Um, and so now it's open source because uh, the government now, uh, they can't hold code uh, once it's released. So it's great for us. Um, but they had this uh, thing called Scribbles. And Scribbles would actually embed code. There's a framework around this, by the way. It tells you how to create it. And what it would do is it would create a watermark um, in, in these documents, Excel documents, uh, everything else. And that watermark would actually beacon out to wherever you want it to to let somebody know that they're opening it from a specific location. So let me ask a question. If you put a passwords.xls with this watermark on there in you know, uh, some random folders and users' accounts that, that you know, they normally didn't go into and someone opened it up, what would that mean? You can even hide it. I mean, you can do other things to, to make it not, not legitimate. But I mean, things like that that can trip up an attacker um, for looking for things like passwords. Like, hey, make it domain name and passwords.xls. I mean, I'm going to open up that document. I'm going to, I'm going to upload that. I'm going to download the document faster than I can type in the command. Um, so those are the things that you can definitely do. Now, if you look at what I was talking about before with clear text passwords and memory, um, a lot of people feel like they've gotten Mimi cats taken care of, right? With Windows 8.1 and above and all the patches that have happened and no longer store credentials in clear text um, uh, <coughs> uh, passwords and memory through WDigest. Well, the truth of the matter, though, is that you only have to do a registry change from a zero to a one to now store passwords in the clear again. So, you know, even if you have that patch enabled or you have Mimikatz, um, you know, effectively solved in your latest versions, all I have to do is, is enable that registry key again and then boot that user off, which, hey, have the user log off and log back in again, and you get passwords. Um, so those are good things to be able to do to be able to run that. As, and Fuzzy Security wrote the, um, the um, invoke run as. Heavily recommend it. Real easy script. You can deploy it through scheduled tasks. Deploys fake passwords across your environment, and boom, you have, have a good detection criteria there. LLMNR, Local Link Multicast Name Resolution and NetBIOS Name Services. Um, if you're not familiar with that, as an attacker, this is like one of our, our biggest changes that we do on a pen test. If you have LLMNR, it's like literally like one of the, the easiest things you can possibly imagine. Um, so what we do is you set up like a, a, a tool called Responder or Invay. Those are the two, two main ones. Uh, I believe you can do the same thing through the Metasploit framework as well. But what it does is it sits there and listens for multicast. What happens is your computer, when you log in, it says, hey, where's file server one at? And it broadcasts it to its local subnet to cut back on, on name, uh, DNS uh, resolution to your domain controllers. And it says, hey, where is everything at? Does anybody know where uh, this file server one's at? You know, it could be a login script. It could be trying to communicate to something and authenticate. It could be an application trying to go out, a service account. What happens is when you're running Responder or Invade, you can be like, yep, I'm file server one. Come on over. And then Windows passes the NetNTLM v1 or NetNTLM v2 directly to you. So then you can go and crack it offline. And everybody has great password complexity, I'm sure, so no one can ever crack those. Um, but, you know, it's one of those things where you can easily get credentials just by sitting there in the environment looking for them. So what do you do in this case? Send fake LLMNR and NBNS across your network. Let them spray. Let them roll. What you do is create a domain name account again. The most sexiest, L, uh, you know, domain name account. This is like super service dash domain admin dash weak password one, two, three, right? <laughs> um, you know, authenticating. And uh, Ben 10, one of the guys from, from Trusted Sec, um, wrote this, and it's uh, um, it's under his his account GitHub.com Ben Zero uh, XA, and it's uh, uh, called Invoke Honeycreds. And there's two ways of detecting it. One is you can actually wait um, for somebody to use that password to crack it. So make it a, a weak username password. What it does is you again you run this as a scheduled task. Maybe have it run every hour or so, um, and it just broadcasts fake LMNR uh, credentials throughout the network. And if someone responds to it and, and accepts it, ask them a weak password. So now they have a weak password that they crack offline, and then what happens if you get a failed login attempt? Right, or you get the axe out, right? Go all shining again. Now the second part about though is you can actually detect this without having a failed login attempt. Um, it's event log 4628, I think. Uh, I'll find that out for you. But uh, what it is, is if you look at it uh, for it, it's explicit credentials were used to log into the remote system. Should explicit credentials that you made up and are not legitimate from a fake account ever be used to log into a remote system? No. So that's an event ID you can detect in VA or responder actually running in your environment right now in this second without even having to worry about a failed login attempt or the user to actually go and crack passwords. So real cool stuff you can actually go and find out there. Uh, creating user accounts. Um, create an admin account and wait for a failed login attempt. Don't even use that admin account. Yes, there's an argument of, of increasing your tax service by adding another, another admin account, but you have to have a local admin account in a box anyway. So use something like LAPS, uh, which is a Microsoft tool that you can use to randomize all of the local admin passwords on the box. Create that admin account and wait for a failed login attempt of that admin account. Should there ever be a failed login admin account for no, for no admin in your environment that you ever use? That's a weird name. No. 
So another uh, couple of minor indicators you can do on that one uh, for that. Detecting SPN extracting and Kerber roasting. Um, so SPNs uh, are, are an interesting one. So service principal names. Uh, there's a way of, of going in once you have a user account, just a domain user account. And you can be like, hey, I, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm asking all the service accounts that have um, access to this computer, can you, you know, start to provide some information to me? And what Windows will do is actually feed you back the credentials. It's a attack vector that actually gives you the, the, the hash values of all the service accounts on those machines. It's a very devastating one. That's one that we always, always use as well, too, so to do escalation permissions. Um, there's a lot of ways of going through that. One is create uh, a fake SPN account, and you can wait for someone to query that uh, specific SPN account and know that it's not legitimate because there's no service account actively going and using that. Um, some great blogs by uh, Sean Metcalf on that one. Uh, so that's one that you can, you can actively go and use. Um, or um, if you look for uh, uh, specific uh, types, and this is also how you detect um, uh, golden tickets as well, by the way, um, is, is if you look at Mimikatz um, as an example, or you look at anything that actually uses um, golden tickets, it will downgrade the Kerberos token to RC4. So you don't normally see in newer platforms and operating systems RC4 happening. Now, there are false positives in SharePoint and in Office 365. So you will see from those two areas, you will see RC4 downgrades happening for backwards compatibility. But aside from those, I really don't see too many RC4 um, uh, requests happening from Kerberos tokens. So you should see those in your environment. You can detect, um, if you see a, um, a, an account authenticating with RC4, um, that's probably a good indication um, that it's using uh, Kerberos thing or it's using uh, uh, Mimikatz to use a golden ticket uh, persistence hook. Um, so good indicators look for um, on that specific one. Well, wrapping things up, um, on this front, there's so many different ways, and, and, I, and, and I can go into deception um, all day long because there's so many different things that we can do to mess up attackers in their environments. Um, you know, boxes that accept any credentials. Um, you can use like the skeleton key um, attack that accepts any username and password and put it on a fake domain that's the same domain name as yours and wait for people to authenticate to it. There's so many different tricks that you can do um, in your environment uh, to, to really uh, capture those. But when it comes down to it, <laughs> you look at the, the protection, the detection, and the deception piece of it, those three components have a very high success factor for what we do as attackers. The hope is to, for us to slip up in some way, shape, or form so you get an early warning indication day one that it happens versus six months or a year down the road, right? We don't want to be in the news six months or a year down the road. We want to be, hey, we're the heroes because we stopped this awesome hack and we did a cool blog post about it and then we stopped at the hour that it happened because we use this cool deception technique, but we're not going to tell you what it is because it's awesome. You know, those are the types of things that I'd want to be remembered for, not the C, you know, CSO that had to resign from an organization because we had a massive data breach. Um, so those are the types of things that I focus on um, and that you should as well um, in this industry. And hopefully you had some good um, you know, detection on there. Slides are available. Uh, if you go to just binarydefense.com slash nolicon, um, you can put in a fake email address and you can still get it, by the way, just throwing that out there. Um, <coughs> so you don't want to put your real one. Um, but uh, if you want to get the slides, they're all uh, here available for you. And if you ever have any questions, you can always hit me uh, up on Twitter at Hacking Dave or um, it's just Dave K at Trusted Sack. I always respond. I don't click on links though, especially not safe links. Um, <laughs> but if anybody has any questions, any questions? Any questions at all? Do I have any DerbyCon tickets? No, I don't have any DerbyCon tickets. <laughs> I, I think there is a there is a rumor going around. By the way, everybody seen the rompers, right? The the onesies, right? For guys, there's now a big thing that's coming out. Onesies for guys, apparently. Uh, there's a rumor going around that DerbyCon will give you free tickets if you wear rompers to the conference. I can neither confirm nor deny that is that is accurate or not. Um, but uh, they're probably be pretty funny if you wore rompers at DerbyCon. So. Good question. So, so Dave's question was, what, do you, what is your um, opinion on disabling those deception techniques? It depends on what your purpose of, of the red team assessment is. Is it to understand, like, hey, we're trying to go through like a real life adversary simulation, and they're going to use some crazy techniques based on our threat model? Uh, then I'd probably keep them there. But if I wanted to, you know, if I want to um, uh, leverage, you know, understanding what my true exposure, especially around like lateral movement and persistence hooks and everything else that I may have uh, lack of visibility on, then I would definitely not uh, incorporate them as part of that assessment because I want to get better in my detection, uh, not get worse. And so, you know, like, oh, hey, I got you because you used my honeycoat token and, you know, now the pen test is over or the red team is over, then that, that's not a good.